I think it's time to start. Uh, good morning. Um, welcome to the second day of the Regulatory Information Conference. Um, I'm Brian Sharon, the Director, Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, uh, and I want to welcome everyone again. Uh, this morning, uh, Commissioner Jeffrey Barron uh, will be speaking. Uh, he was sworn in as a commissioner on January 2nd, 2015. Uh, to serve the remainder of a term ending June 30th, uh, 2018. He was originally sworn in as a commissioner on October 14th, 2014, to a term ending July 30th, 2015. Uh, uh, before coming to NRC, he worked on Capitol Hill for over a de decade. He's originally from Chicago, and the commissioner earned a bachelor and a master's degree on from, on, I'm sorry, in political science from Ohio University. He also holds a law degree from Harvard Law School, and most importantly, this is his first RIC. So with that, uh, let's give a warm welcome to the Commissioner. Thanks, Brian. Good morning. I um, hope everyone enjoyed the first day of the RIC and arrived ready for another full day of events. I'm very happy to be here with all of you for my first RIC. And as you might imagine, uh, this being my first RIC, I got a lot of advice about my remarks today. Uh, and it is all, let me start by saying, it is all genuinely appreciated. Uh, Commissioner Spinnecke encouraged me yesterday uh, to seize day two of the RIC and make it my own. Uh, but how does one go about doing that? Well, one former commissioner told me that this is my one chance each year to be philosophical. On the other hand, someone else suggested that I avoid getting too ethereal. One person said, it's important to make three main points. Uh, <laughs> but another said I should really have a single major theme. I've been told that I should demonstrate a deep understanding of the issues. I've been told that I shouldn't get too into the weeds. Uh, a friend told me that it was important to somehow work stairway to heaven into the speech. <laughs> I don't know what that's about, uh, but consider that box checked. Uh, my favorite piece of advice, though, came yesterday on my way home. On the Metro platform, someone told me, and this is a quote, have better jokes. <laughs> now, that is not, I don't think that was anything negative towards any of the jokes from yesterday, but. Um, well, our good friends in the news media have met that challenge. This morning, Politico actually provided me a joke for delivery today. Uh, do, you want, do you guys want to hear it? You got to want it. Yeah, okay. All right, brace yourself. What's the favorite food of a British physicist? Fission chips. All right. Please send all complaints about that joke to Darius Dixon, care of Politico Pro. Uh, this event is all uh, new to me, but my initial impression is that it seems to be a little bit like a nuclear safety prom. Uh, it's the big once a year gathering where everyone's dressed up and excited to see each other and to catch up. There are fancy dinners and receptions. Christine Svinicky told us that she's fussing with her hair. Uh, there's no dancing as far as I know, uh, but there are four huge Jeff Barron heads on the screens behind me, so that probably makes up for the lack of dancing. Uh, for those of you who have been attending the RIC for years, I may be an unfamiliar face or an unfamiliar giant head on a screen, as the case may be. So let me take a moment to briefly introduce myself. Many of you know that I'm an attorney. Before joining the commission in October, I worked for over a decade on Capitol Hill. During my first five years on the Hill, I served as counsel on the staff of the House of Representatives Oversight Committee, where I worked on a range of issues, including nuclear issues. Beginning in 2009, I spent about six years working on the staff of the House of Representatives Energy and Commerce Committee, the House Committee with Jurisdiction over NRC. One of my main responsibilities during that time was oversight of NRC and of nuclear energy and waste issues. Over that 11-year period, I had a number of opportunities to work across the aisle to develop bipartisan legislation. I had the privilege of helping to negotiate bills that became law with broad bipartisan support, including legislation on medical isotopes, pipeline safety, energy efficiency, and hydropower. I think that legal and policymaking work was good preparation for my current role in the Commission. 
It is a great honor, a real honor, to serve as a member of the Commission and to work on issues important to our vital mission of protecting health, safety, and the environment. I am committed to bringing an open-minded and thoughtful approach to the policymaking, rulemaking, and adjudicatory issues that come before us. I have truly enjoyed working with my fellow Commissioners these last few months. Collectively, we bring a wide range of experience and perspectives to our deliberations, which I think is valuable. While there are only four of us on the Commission right now, we are all working very well together to get the work of the Commission done. During my years on the Hill closely following NRC's work, I benefited from many briefings with NRC staff. I have long been impressed by their experience and dedication. Since I arrived in October, I obviously have had the opportunity to interact with many more NRC staff members and continue to be struck by the quality of the people who work at this agency. After my confirmation in the fall, when I was begin beginning to staff my office, I looked within the NRC staff to assemble my team, and I believe it is a terrific team. Uh, Amy Powell is my chief of staff. Everyone, they're all like in the second row right there. Uh, if we had like a spotlight capability, that would be great right now. But Amy Powell is my chief of staff. Uh, Jody Martin is my legal counsel. Rob Kersick is my reactor's technical assistant. And Rayanne Shane is my materials technical assistant. My administrative assistants are Renee Taylor and Stacy Schumann. I hope that you all have the opportunity to meet and talk with them this week. During my years working for Congress, I also benefited from many meetings with utility representatives and trade associations. On a number of occasions, I worked with these and other stakeholders to develop the consensus legislation I mentioned earlier. As a commissioner, I look forward to continuing to build those relationships. Since I arrived in October, I've made it a priority to begin visiting NRC-regulated facilities, including recent tours of Peach Bottom, Watts Bar, and North Anna. I plan to head to Vogel in summer, early this spring, along with the Westinghouse facility in Columbia. I've been impressed with the professionalism and knowledge demonstrated by the personnel at the nuclear plants I have visited, and I look forward to visiting additional facilities in the near future. I thought I would use my remaining time this morning to share some of my initial impressions of NRC after five months on the job and give you a sense of what I see as likely areas of focus for the agency going forward. I also want to leave plenty of time for questions. As many of you know from watching and working with the Commission through the years, we work on tough, complex issues. And there are several important items currently in front of the Commission. As a general matter, I believe that we need to hear a wide range of perspectives from the staff, stakeholders, and the public as we deliberate on these matters. I think we make the best decisions when we get input from a broad range of stakeholders. First and foremost, we are always focused on our mission of protecting public health and safety. This priority governs all that we do. Currently, five new reactors are being built in the United States, and five reactors recently ceased operations and are entering decommissioning. At the construction sites, NRC is conducting oversight to ensure that the new plants are built safely and in accordance with regulatory requirements. With respect to decommissioning, the Commission recently directed the NRC staff to proceed with a rulemaking. Although the risk profile of a permanently shut down reactor is very different than that of an operating reactor, NRC does not currently have regulations specifically tailored for permanently shut down reactors. Because of this gap in NRC's regulatory framework, licensees with reactors transitioning to decommissioning routinely seek exemptions from many of the regulations applicable to operating reactors. This approach of regulation by exemption is inefficient for both NRC and its licensees. The exemption approach does not improve the stability and predictability of the licensing process and does not allow for effective public input or improved public understanding of the decommissioning process. So I support the staff's effort to take a fresh look at these decommissioning issues. We can benefit from the lessons learned from the recently shut down plants and the closures in the 1990s, and there is real value in taking public comment on decommissioning issues that are of great interest to many stakeholders. The agency, along with its licensees, continues to address post-Fukushima safety enhancements and lessons learned. The tsunami and resulting nuclear accident rightly caused NRC to take a fresh look at its assumptions and regulations. Given the work that many of you have done directly on these initiatives, I'm sure you all know that substantial progress has been made in several areas. But I think we all recognize that more work remains to be done. For example, flex mitigation equipment is now present at a number of plants around the country, and two regional response centers are fully operational. Uniform connections for generators, pumps, and hoses should provide tremendous flexibility in responding to future beyond design basis events. However, many plants will not have all of their new mitigation capabilities in place until next year, and we still need to ensure that the new equipment can withstand the reevaluated seismic and flooding hazards at the sites where it may someday be needed. 
Today marks four years since the Fukushima accident, and we all need to maintain our focus on implementing the lessons learned from that tragedy in a timely way. We look forward to your insights, creativity, and commitment as we all work to complete these essential efforts. Security will continue to be a major focus of NRC's activities in the coming years. Cyber attacks and infiltrations remain an evolving and significant threat. Enforceable, performance-based standards are already in place for nuclear reactors, but we also need to make sure that we protect the digital systems at fuel cycle facilities as well. The Commission is currently considering whether additional actions are appropriate in this area. If the Commission decides to initiate a rulemaking to enhance cybersecurity at fuel cycle facilities, I believe it is important that it be conducted and implemented expeditiously. Cyber vulnerabilities at all NRC regulated facilities should be addressed in a timely way. These are just a few of the issues that will continue to be priorities for NRC. For these and other issues, I believe we must continuously strive to be the gold standard in nuclear safety and security regulation. That's not an accolade an agency earns one day and declares itself satisfied. We have to work tirelessly to further improve the way we do business in protecting the public health, safety, and environment. That drive for excellence applies to another priority for the Commission, the continued improvement of our licensing process for new reactors and designs. The Commission recently certified the ESBWR design and held an uncontested hearing for the combined license application for Fermi Unit 3. We expect to hold an uncontested hearing on at least one other combined license application in the coming months. While NRC continues its work on pending applications for new reactors, we need to be ready to accept and review applications submitted for new technologies. The staff accepted the APR 1400 design certification application for review just last week. We are expecting to receive the first application for a small modular reactor design in 2016. NRC already is reviewing an application for a new production facility for medical isotopes and anticipates additional applications of this type in the future. I think we are well positioned to handle SMR and medical isotope production applications, but we're always open to feedback on how our process is working. Nevertheless, the agency faces a different environment than what was expected just a few years ago when substantial new reactor construction was anticipated and no licensees had yet announced plans to shut down any reactors. To meet our responsibilities now and in the future, we need to enhance the efficiency, effectiveness, and agility of the agency. In order, to disrupt, in order to avoid disrupting the agency's work, it is important to set a thoughtful trajectory to the appropriate resource and staffing levels over the next few years. We need to make sure that we do a good job matching resources to expected workload. Before I joined the Commission, my colleagues had the foresight to initiate Project AIM 2020, an internal working group tasked with looking at the changes NRC should make to prepare for the future. I think you've all heard quite a bit about that in the last day or so. This is a valuable and timely effort. We are actively deliberating on the recommendations of the Project AIM team, and I expect that the Commission will approve some prudent actions in the near term. Finally, I think we need a renewed focus on enhancing our transparency and openness with Congress, stakeholders, and the broader public. Transparency and openness allow Congress to fulfill its important oversight function and the public to actively engage, participate in NRC's regulatory activities. As I said earlier, I think we make the best decisions when we hear from a diverse mix of stakeholders. That dialogue doesn't just help us to improve our communications about what we are doing. It actually helps us to make better decisions in the first place. It forces us to question our assumptions and to think creatively about new approaches to regulatory challenges. Openness means sharing as much information as we can, describing the issues and the agency's work in understandable language, and being open to the feedback that we receive. Our Congressional Oversight and Appropriations Committees are more interested than ever in NRC's mission and the way we are carrying out that mission. I firmly believe that NRC can provide Congress with the information it needs to perform its oversight duties while preserving the independence that is essential to accomplishing our safety and security mission. Once again, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today and throughout the week. I look forward to meeting many of you during this conference and to seeing your facilities in the U.S. and abroad in the future. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. There's plenty of time for it. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Is this? Okay, now it's on. Um, we have several questions here, um, so I'll start. Uh, given your experience on Capitol Hill and recent experience at NRC, 
What is it going to take to get our government to move forward in establishing a long-term storage repository for used nuclear fuel? Wow, you guys are playing hardball. <laughs> if I had the answer to that question, I don't know. Um, well, let me talk just for a second about what we're doing now. So we, um, we had some appropriated funds from the Nuclear Waste Fund um, that uh, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals instructed the NRC to expend. So with those funds, uh, the staff recently completed the safety evaluation report that happened in January. With the funds we have remaining, um, the staff will work to supplement the environmental impact statement, um, particularly on, a, on issues related to drinking water. Um, we're also going to, we, we had the uh, licensing support network which housed all the documents for the proceedings um, and there should be funds available to transfer those and make them publicly available on uh, our Adam system. There's also some lessons learned and kind of archiving activities that need to be done with respect to the safety evaluation report and we believe there will be funds available for that as well. So the commission recently decided that's the path forward uh, with the funds we have remaining. Um, and then really I think it's, it's a question um, not so much for NRC but for the Congress about whether or not it wants to appropriate additional funds for future activities. Um, some preliminary staff estimates um, indicate that it would be you know, north of $300 million for um, just the NRC part of the adjudicatory piece of this. I mean we have I believe 288 contentions um, that were filed uh, and there could of course be additional contentions filed in the future if the adjudicatory proceedings were to uh, be reopened, restarted. So um, that's obviously a really significant task, working through that kind of work, uh, even if there is funding available to do it. Um, and, and frankly, I have real questions about whether that process uh, would, be, would work um, unless we have a, an engaged applicant who's really uh, committed to pursuing their application. I mean, this is an adversarial trial-like process before the board. It would take uh, a considerable amount of effort to go through that process. Uh, and in the absence of an applicant who is not only the legal applicant, but an applicant who is uh, interested in, in pursuing their application, um, I think that's a pretty challenging process. Uh, next question is, given your experience in the waste area, do you expect the NRC to issue Part 61 soon? When do you expect the SECI paper to be released? This is a question from the staff who worked on Part 61, I bet this is. <laughs> um, so uh, this, is, uh, this is something that's being uh, actively deliberated on by the, uh, by the Commission, so I, I probably shouldn't say too much there. Um, the, the staff prepared a proposed rule and it's, it's before the commission for their review. Okay. That probably answered that question for everyone's satisfaction, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, as a newcomer, you have an opportunity to change or at least in influence the commission's institutional culture. What are your thoughts in that regard? Is the culture all that it could be? Is the culture all that it could be? Well. Um, the Project AIM 2020 recommendations that, that we received um, suggested that although the culture is good, it could be even better. Um, and I think that's probably always true, right, of, of well, I guess, it, I guess you could have an organization that has just a bad culture, but that's not what we have at NRC. We have a very good culture. Um, I'm very impressed with, with our staff and their dedication. Uh, one thing I think is important, and, um, you know, cultural changes I don't think are ever really easy, uh, but one thing I think going forward that, uh, <coughs> is important. We heard a lot yesterday about efficiency and I think that is very important. But I think agility is really important as well. Um, I think if we look back five years ago and tried to predict the future, what is, what is it going to look like in 2015? I don't think anyone really would have predicted the last five years um, for the nuclear sector. I don't think people would have predicted Fukushima and all the efforts that would go into responding to that. Um, I think with respect to NRC in particular, I don't think people would have anticipated um, the reduced number of, of new reactor applications that we have and, and how that's affected our workload. So I think there's never going to be perfect prediction about the future. We could try now and look at the next five years and say, what do we think it's going to look like in 2020? And we're almost certainly going to be at least a little bit wrong about that, uh, maybe a lot wrong about that. And so what does that mean? I think it means as an agency, we have to have the agility 
to be ready for whatever comes our way. We have our expectation about what, uh, particularly in the licensing context, for example, what we're expecting, but we don't know for sure. There could be additional applications or some of the applications we're anticipating may not materialize. So we have to make sure we have the right skills at the agency and the ability to deploy those skill sets on whatever work uh, we actually have in the coming years. So that's one um, element of, of kind of the culture or organization of the, of the agency that I think is important. Uh, the courts have directed NRC to proceed with Yucca Mountain to the extent that it has funding. Will the commission ask for funding to proceed with Yucca Mountain licensing? Well, so a um, bit of history. So for the, for the fiscal year 2016 budget, I was not around for uh, most of that budget formulation process. I came in at the tail end um, of, uh, of that process. And it, for fiscal year 2016, the commission did not um, request funds. Um, we are now, of course, just starting the fiscal year 2017 process. So I, um, I don't want to make any predictions about what will happen there. Um, I, for one, just personally um, do not think it makes sense for NRC to request those funds um, unless our applicant, the Department of Energy, is requesting funds and unless we um, get an indication that uh, our applicant is interested in and in being engaged in pursuing uh, their application. I think um, in the absence of that, um, there's no amount of funding in the world that NRC could get that is going to get us through that adjudicatory process. Okay. Uh, being new at the NRC, you must have observations about the way in which the NRC functions that those who have been here for a while do not. In what ways can the NRC be more agile in the future? What can it learn from other federal agencies and from regulators in other countries? Well, I think we could, uh, this, is, this is one of those questions that falls into the you know, uh, doctoral dissertation uh, category, <laughs> I think. Um, I think we can learn and we do learn a lot from our uh, counterparts abroad, um, I think meetings like this and conferences like this are really valuable in that regard. We, as commissioners, spend a lot of our time during, the, during these days um, having uh, bilateral conversations with our colleagues, uh, and I at least, uh, and I think probably all of us, get a lot out of that. I think we um, learn a lot um, from activities that are going on abroad. You know, we have four AP-1000s being constructed here in the United States, but there are AP-1000s being constructed in China, and I think we're getting a lot of good information from and lessons learned from the process over there. So um, on the international side of things, I think um, it's extraordinarily valuable. I think we have a lot to offer uh, other nuclear regulatory uh, bodies abroad, and I think we have a lot to learn from them. Um, and so I, I see it as a two-way street, and I think it's a really valuable uh, relationship or a set of relationships. Okay. Having been involved in, le in the legislative branch of government interfacing with the NRC, do you share the opinions of the majority of the commissioners on rulings related to waste confidence, approval of new reactor builds, and Fukushima actions? Wow, okay, so um, uh, this, is, this is more like a confirmation hearing type question. <laughs> I thought we were through those. Um, uh, okay, what's our list? Continued storage. So on continued storage, continued storage, my colleagues um, uh, re resolved that question just a few months before I arrived um, and, uh, and decided on an approach of, of having a generic environmental impact statement and a company in rule uh, and moving away from the approach that had been used for some time on waste confidence findings. And so it got a, a nifty new name and we call it continued storage now. Uh, and we have an actual environmental impact statement as opposed to a set of findings. So I think um, that's a reasonable approach uh, to, to responding to that, that court decision that we got. Um, and um, I think ultimately it's going to be, again, the courts that decide whether that's an adequate approach. What else is on the list? Uh, it was new reactors and Fukushima actions. New reactors. Um, well, right, right before I arrived, um, 
my, uh, my colleagues had approved the ESBWR. Uh, I wasn't here for that, and um, I was here, though, for Fermi Unit 3 uh, for the uncontested uh, hearing for that, and, and we'll be deliberating on um, Fermi Unit 3, which, of course, is an ESBWR, or would be. Um, so uh, folks will know what I think about that in the, in the, sh in the near term, but we're uh, actively deliberating on that. What's next? We've got a long list. Uh, it was new reactors and then Fukushima actions. Fukushima actions. Well, so um, as I mentioned in my my remarks, I think it's um, I think it's clear that a, a lot of progress has been made in a lot of areas, but we're also still implementing in those areas. And I think um, the way the commission uh, organized our work in that area made a lot of sense. So um, tiering it by both a combination of urgency, but also our ability to actually uh, do what needs to be done in those areas in terms of whether there's additional research needed. Um, I think, you know, having tiers one, two, and three makes sense. We've, we've worked our way through, or they worked their way through um, a lot of that work. Um, and now we're really, for a lot of that work, in the implementation stage. Um, and so I think as we go on that, there are going to be bumps in the road. Um, we, you know, have had seismic reevaluations done. We're in the stage now of, of a lot of some folks screened in, some folks screened out, um, and, and we have seismic PRAs that are going to be going on for some time. On flooding, um, the progress there, I think, um, has been a little bit slower, um, and that's a challenge that um, the Commission is currently wrestling with. We have a, a paper in front of us on um, on the flooding approach. Uh, but I think there, too, there's, there's going to be a way forward that both um, gets the necessary analysis done, makes sure that our plants are ready um, on the flooding side of things uh, to protect and to mitigate anything that does happen, um, but also to provide some clarity uh, to folks going forward about what that process is going to look like. And, you know, in, in some of these multi-year processes, you know, they get started, and it's not always apparent to everyone at the very beginning how it's all going to look and play out over those years. Um, so I think it's good for the Commission to revisit these things um, and to provide additional guidance and clarity about, um, about the path forward. Okay. You mentioned making better decisions through better public p participation. What could the NRC do to better engage with the public? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. Now you really called me on it. I can't just say we should do a better job engaging. I've got to say something about what we should do and how we should do it, I guess. Um, I think my sense from, from watching NRC um, over the years, and, uh, but not being at NRC over the years, is um, that we could do better a lot of times on the communication front. And um, I actually can tell a little bit of a story about this. When I was, when I was interviewing... I guess this was back in September. I was interviewing for my staff, um, and uh, I think everyone I interviewed was from NRC. And I did probably a couple dozen of interviews. And uh, one of the questions I would ask folks is, just to kind of see how they thought about things and what they came up with, was, you know, is there something that you think the agency does really well? And is there something that you think um, the agency could improve at? And, I thought I'd get a variety of answers. People obviously approach things differently. They'd come up with different things. But I got almost the exact same answer from every single person I talked to. I mean, there were a couple outliers. Um, I won't name names on that. But almost everyone um, told me the same thing. And what they said is, NRC and the staff are technically extremely capable. And people would say they've never worked at a place where the, the caliber of the technical staff is as good as it is in NRC. And in my five months here, I think that's... That's right. Um, my experience bears that out. But they also said, almost to a person, we could do better communicating with the public about what we do. Um, and so I was struck by that even before I arrived here on day one. It was you know, kind of pre-arrival. And I think that's true. You know, I, I think part of it goes to being as clear in our language as we can. You know, we, we deal with highly technical issues, um, complex issues. And, and we're used to, I think, frequently engaging with folks who have a long history on those issues and have a lot of technical expertise on those issues. Um, and, and sometimes I think the, the language can get a little bit impenetrable. Um, and so I think that's one thing we can do. 
Um, it's not easy, you know, because you all you develop shorthands over time for things and, and acronyms and all that stuff. Um, and they're inherently technical and complex issues in many cases, and you have to address them in that way. But I think that's one, one thing we can do to be conscious of that um, when we put out a document, you know, and it's out atoms and it's publicly available, um, you know, can we make it as readable as possible to, to um, someone who is a concerned stakeholder, uh, who may not have an engineering degree or a PhD in the relevant uh, technical field, but is interested and wants to understand what we're doing. And um, I think that's the kind of thing that every time we're writing one of those documents we should be thinking about. Um, and some documents are going to be more difficult to digest than others, but that's, that's a start. And then I think, and I do, we, you know, we saw a video about this yesterday, um, and I think the agency can be variable on this, but um, it's, we, we've had lots of stakeholder meetings, we've had meetings with the public, and those are extremely important. We have to make sure we're doing a good job, and I'm not saying that we aren't now, but do a good job truly listening to what we're hearing um, and, and respond to that feedback and, and learn from what we're hearing. Um, because people want a sense, I think, that they're genuinely being heard, that they're not just getting an opportunity to stand up and, and talk for a minute, but that what they're saying is being listened to and considered in the process. And so um, that's not something you either do or don't do. Um, it's a spectrum, and you just try to get better and better at that as you go. Okay. Okay, now we're going to continue with your confirmation hearing. Okay. Uh, Yes, you, Senator, what is your question? Do you think Congress is posed, poised to pass legislation to modify the Nuclear Waste Policy Act and incorporate the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendations? Well, having worked on, on Capitol Hill for 11 years, I, I am always reluctant to say Congress is poised to do anything. Um, <laughs> it's a wonderful institution. I, I loved working there for many years. Um, well, there's clearly a lot of interest in it. I mean, it's... Um, you know, for, for the reasons we kind of discussed, um, high-level waste it can be a, a pretty intractable policy and political issue in this country. And, and that's, that makes it tough for Congress to act, I think. Um, but I think it's um, good that there's a real conversation going on about that, because obviously we need a solution there. And um, when we, when my colleagues and I recently testified in the Senate uh, before the Appropriations Committee, um, I'd say about half the time was spent talking about these, uh, these waste issues, which is good. And um, there's, there's interest in um, finding a path for consolidated interim storage among some members, and there's interest in, um, in uh, focusing on Blue Ribbon Commission um, recommendations that aren't related to interim storage. There's also a lot of uh, interest still on the Hill in just proceeding with Yucca Mountain. And so whether um, the, the members of the House and the Senate can, can come to some kind of compromise on all that, I don't know. Um, but it's good that the conversation's happening. Uh, it's good that they're actively um, getting additional information on these issues. They're tough issues, um, obviously, or we would have resolved it by now. And that's, um, that's an area where I think we can learn a lot from our colleagues abroad. Uh, and that was part of, I think, what the Blue Ribbon Commission found when they did their work, is that um, uh, there are some innovative things going on um, in other countries that we should be aware of. And, uh, but I, you know, I'm also struck that when I have meetings, and we have meetings with our, our international counterparts this week, we'll hear that we're not the only country that's struggling with this. It's a tough problem. It's been a tough problem um, since really the founding of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, so um, Congress could surprise us and have a really good year um, and, and resolve this, and that would be terrific. Um, because I think ultimately um, it, is, it is for Congress um, and the President uh, to resolve. It's, this is, these are the big policy questions. Um, and we have a law on the books right now, and that is the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, and that is the law that the NRC um, will implement. Um, but when it comes to the question of should changes be made to that, should we go in another direction, that is a question for Congress. 
Okay. Uh, this one's obviously from Eric Leeds. What are your <laughs> What are your top three goals as a commissioner? Top three goals. Well, um, I get this. This is a question not quite that precise that I've gotten um, often. Uh, you know, people ask. I think generally, you know, new commissioners, what are your goals? What are, What's your agenda? And um, and what I tell everyone, because it's true, um, and is that uh, I didn't come here with a, with a long list, uh, a to-do list, uh, a personal agenda. Uh, my approach is, my focus is to just really ensure nuclear safety in a balanced and thoughtful way. And I want to be open-minded about the issues that come before us. I mean, we get a steady stream um, of really interesting uh, and sometimes tough um, policy and rulemaking and adjudicatory issues. And some of my colleagues reference that. It's just a conveyor belt of these things that you, you, you deal with. Um, and my own view is it's just important to approach each of those with an open mind, which is easier to do at the beginning uh, you know, of, a, of a tenure uh, than after you've actually voted on things and have kind of a track record and views on certain issues. So. Um, I'm in a great spot right now where I can look at things with um, a fresh pair of eyes and, and just think them through on the merits as they come. Okay. What do you think about the WCS announcement about the spent nuclear fuel interim storage in Texas? Can we get this done? I'm detecting a theme. Um, well, it's, you know, this was one of the, uh, this, so far, we've received a, a letter um, from WCS that's basically an, a, a letter of intent to file an application for uh, a, a freestanding um, dry cask storage facility uh, in Texas, and um, they, they expect to provide that application to us uh, next year. So obviously, um, we, we need to wait for that application and review it, and we can't make any decisions about it before then. Um, but in terms of what the specific uh, business plan is, you know, associated with that, obviously uh, WCS is, um, is the right organization to ask about that. But then that does get you into the questions about is it, uh, is it something that requires any change to the Nuclear Waste Policy Act? Um, is it something that requires appropriations for the Department of Energy um, to contract with WCS? And so those, I think that pretty quickly um, gets us back into issues that, that relate to Congress. There's a piece of this, obviously, um, the, the licensing piece that relates um, uh, and is in the purview of the commission, but uh, I think they're potentially, depending on the, the application and the, the business plan, may involve things you know, beyond the commission. Uh, I guess this person really wasn't aware that it said with two attorneys on the commission, but it's really with three attorneys on the commission do you see more emphasis on legal issues rather than technical issues? No, I don't think so. I think um, it's, uh, I guess it's true that we, we now have temporarily a majority of, uh, of lawyers, although I never think of Bill Ossendorf that way, not because he's not a brilliant lawyer, but because um, the guy was a nuclear submarine captain, and that's how I think of him. Um, <laughs> so I don't... I don't really count them on the, on the lawyer side, um, but, uh, but I think it's great. I mean, I think, um, well, obviously, I think it's great that we have a couple lawyers. Um, Steve Burns probably thinks it's great, too. Um, it's, I think it's good. I think it's, it's really important to have a good mix on the commission um, because we get, uh, some of the issues are really technical. A lot of the issues are not as technical. They're really... Um, uh, more management issues or, or policy issues that are about setting priorities or, or other things that don't get into the technical weeds. And then we also have a chunk of our work that is um, adjudicatory and uh, where I think it, um, I hope that, you know, I'm, uh, having lawyers is, is, uh, is helpful and contributes to our deliberations there. Um, I don't want to make it sound like the commission is entirely a reactive body because we're not, but we, we do get papers that come up from the staff and we make these decisions as, we, as, um, as they come. And we, we obviously don't control um, who decides to appeal a ruling of the ASLB to us. Um, so uh, I think that generally speaking, most of our, our workload in that way is, is kind of um, brought to us by others. Um, but I think it's... Uh, 
I, I for one at least think it's valuable and I think just in my five months I felt that. Um, to have folks with different backgrounds and different areas of experience and expertise. Um, because when you have a decision-making body of, of five people, or four right now, um, I think that's really valuable. Because, I mean, the whole premise, I think, behind the commission structure for decision-making is that you bring different people together, and uh, they have different experiences, and they have conversations and negotiations and debate about what the right answer is. Um, and I think having four or five people who are all clones of one another really kind of defeats the purpose of that. Um, having, uh, having people with different perspectives and different backgrounds, I think, um, makes, that, makes that model work um, even better. Okay. Uh, what do you think of small modular reactors and their chances for deployment in the U.S.? Well, um, so we'll, we're going we're gonna to find out the answer to that question. Um, so we're expecting um, you know, our first application for a design certification uh, next year. And um, I think, as I mentioned in remarks, I think we're, the, commission's been, the commission as an agency has been uh, pretty forward-leaning in this regard. Um, we, we are working on uh, design-specific uh, review standards so that we're ready to review specific applications. Um, and that's, that process is ongoing um, for, the, for the application we're expecting next year. Um, and we're also, the staff has been, this is something they were doing before I arrived and I think are continuing to do, think through, sometimes with um, at least the knowledge of the commission but also in, in some cases with their input about what are the potentially novel issues associated with SMRs and, and how are we going to resolve those? How are we going to resolve control room staffing issues or fee issues, um, emergency planning issues, the, the issues that are going to be a little bit different potentially or a lot different for small modular reactors than for, um, for the larger uh, light water reactors. So I think though my sense is we, we did have a commission meeting on this and I've had um, you know, additional briefings and conversations about it. I think we're, we're well positioned um, as an agency to um, review uh, applications like, uh, like the one we're expecting next year. Uh, and it's something we're going to have to stay on top of. And it's something where, once again, if, um, you know, I, we should be ready uh, and to, to do it in a timely way. And if, if there are hiccups, uh, you know, we want to hear about those. Okay. A lot of public opposition to nuclear power seems to be based on an almost irrational and certainly uh, uninformed level of fear. What can and should we do about this? Well, for the, um, for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is really an agency focused on safety, obviously the most important thing we can do is make sure that the plants operating in this country are safe. Um, and to the extent um, there is information that we as an agency have um, that the public should know about. We should make sure we're, we're clearly communicating that. Um, but on the, you know, kind of the flip side of that, of course, that's, so that's our job. That's clearly within our purview and it's, some, it's absolutely what we should be doing. You know, it's also not our job, though, to promote nuclear power. That's, um, that's someone else's job, the Department of Energy, the industry. Our job is to ensure safety and security. Um, and I think the best way for us uh, to uh, affect views about nuclear power is to do that job very well. Okay. Uh, this one is, do you have any concerns over staff safety at public meetings where there are very aggressive outside groups? For example, what occurred at the recent Vermont Yankee decommissioning public meeting? Well, um, I haven't, I haven't heard anyone bring um, concerns of staff safety um, to the commission, um, but I think, and I, I, th I think there was a, uh, the most recent meeting uh, in Vermont actually uh, went pretty well from the feedback I heard. Um, you know, it's, these can be emotional issues for people, and, um, but we obviously need to keep the lines of communication open, um, and it's important that that people who participate obviously have the opportunity to express their views as strongly as they want to express them, but, um, but being conscious of the, uh, the safety and rights of others. And um, I, 
I think uh, uh, that can be tough, but I also, I also haven't heard anyone suggest that we should do anything other than continue to do those types of meetings and make sure that we're engaging with the public on issues that, um, that people care about. Okay. Um, I, looking at my clock here, I think, uh, I think your confirmation hearing's over. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. But uh, oh. anyway, I uh, want you to You are like you. Congress. <laughs> <laughs> no. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.